Okay. But you are live. All right. Let me just make one update here. All right. Hi, Mike. I just made Susan a host, oh. and I'm stepping out. There she oh, is. I'm Thanks sorry. Back. I misread my calendar. No, it's okay. I, I got him. him. He's Great. all yours. Thanks for coming to Canvas Hour. And um, today we've got Michael Clayton, who's going to walk us through various ways to both um, create videos and incorporate them into um, your Canvas course. Michael, take it away. Sorry to have been late. Oh, no, that's fine. All right, so, all right, so just as a reiteration, um, so my name is Mike Clayton. I'm a professor of graphic design uh, in the graphic design program in the School of Media and Design. And in the spring, uh, my Canvas Hour was kind of a compressed two topic one where I talked about what you can do with video and then how to put video and integrate that into Canvas. So what I asked uh, Dr. Hall and, and Kathy if I could do this summer was split those in half. So the sessions this week are about what to do with video and the sessions next week are how to put video inside of Canvas and the different ways that you can go through and you can use it. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is simply um, some of the things that, that we can do um, with, with video. Let me go ahead and get my little thing set up here so that I can get this set up. And then I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna get the chat up there. So you don't need to have your, I'm not talking about anything in Canvas today. So there's no reason to be in the Canvas dashboard today, Lisa. So that's, that's cool. Thanks for asking. All right. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me make sure I can see all of you beautiful people out there in TV land. That's what I called all the students when I was doing high flex stuff in the spring. I had the <laughs> folks in class and the folks in TV land. And so I said, okay, you in TV land, if you have a question, just interrupt me because I can't see you most of the time. All right. Let me just bring this out a little bit more. I want to be able to see everybody. We've got a good group of folks here today. All right. So right now you should see a slide that says what to do with video, right? Okay, mm -hmm. sweet. So what I want to talk about is I'm going to kind of break this down into the different types of video we can create, the different kinds of hardware that we need um, in order to do it. And I'm going to do it on a... Now, when I was a kid, my, my mom would turn on PBS and uh, watch these exercise videos where they had the lady in the middle who was doing the moderate exercise. And then you had the one on the right that was doing like the low impact. And then you had the lady on the left who just was full of energy and did the high impact. <laughs> so I'm kind of going to talk about it in, in those terms where, you know, what you should do, what you can do and what is possible. So this is gonna kind of fit to, to different types of, of levels and to your comfort zone um, on, on things. So when we think about video inside of our classes and the different things we can create, um, what we've probably done is just live lectures and demos. We've gone into class, we're inside of Zoom, we've hit that little record button and it's recording to the cloud or our desktop. And then when we're done, you know, we distribute it to the students via YouTube or stream or, or something like that. Um, or if you're in Teams, um, it'll actually just push it right over to stream at the end if you do your classes that way. Um, so those are the live kind of videos that we can create. There's also pre-recorded lectures and demos. Um, my wife is taking classes at Incarnate Word and last spring when uh, we had the pivot into the pandemic, um, one of her teachers created these wonderful, comprehensive, uh, pre-recorded lectures um, that she really appreciated. And I'm going to talk about um, what happened there and, and some of the things in, in that. And even demonstrations. Like me, within uh, graphic design, I have a lot of hands-on demonstrations, a lot of skills-based things that the students need to know. 
And so I didn't get too caught up. I pre-recorded those demos and asked them to watch them outside of, of class. Um, then there's captured lecture, lectures and demos, um, which are a little bit different than live ones. Maybe you have a fake audience and you're just pre-recording some stuff that way. Or supplemental videos, things that you record beforehand to have your students use as supplemental or they could be video clips from other sources or different things like that. Um, using video to give feedback. Uh, if you attended uh, Jacob's um, speed grader things in the last week or so, um, I'm gonna talk some of the things he talked about there. Then also kind of creating a community uh, using, using these, these videos. All right, so producing and creating content. So number one, you have to have the right kind of hardware and able to go through and to create a, a video. Now, most of you probably have one of these three sorts of setups when you're going through to, to create content. You either have a desktop computer that's attached to an external monitor. You might have a laptop, like what's shown in the upper right-hand corner. Or you might have a tablet, maybe it's an iPad or maybe it's a Surface Pro or some other sort of tablet-based um, computing device. Well, the thing about that is it doesn't matter which one you have. You can use any of these to go through and to create content. So I'm not going to sit and preach one device over another or whatever. It's just you have to use what you've got and use that to the best of, of what you can. But what's really important about the video that you capture is the type, it's not the type of display, but the resolution that it is. Now, this is where I get a kick into professor lecture mode because this might be something that you all might not know about. You know, when you look at the computer that you have in front of you, um, I happen to have a really interesting setup where I have two 27 inch monitors and I've got my six inch laptop over here on my left. So I have these three giant screens. Some of you may just have a computer, a laptop with a 15 inch screen. Some of you may have an external PC with maybe a 21 or a 27 or a 34 inch monitor. So we may have all these different wild sizes of screens. The size of the screen doesn't matter, but the resolution of the screen, how many pixels across is your image? How many pixels down is your image? Now, this next image is not meant to scare you, but it's meant to uh, enlighten you as to the vast difference between displays that are on the market today. So if we go through and take a look at computer monitors, at TV screens, at devices and different things like that, um, we can see, and even looking at paper, you know, so, you know, there's the A4. So I kind of wish we used the, the A4 method and A3 method of paper. I love the idea of halves versus, you know, what we've got in the metrics. Um, but standard um, screens, like what you have on your laptop, you may have something that is more of a, a larger screen. Um, let me break it down this way. Behind me, I have on my wall a 53 inch television. That 53 inch television has a pixel dimension of 1920 pixels across and 1080 pixels down. So that is how big that image is on that right there. Also on my desk, I have a 20 inch, a 21 inch television that has the same resolution. There are the same number of pixels in my little 21 inch monitor as there are in that 53 inch monitor behind me. So that is, that is the idea of resolution. My little 21 inch TV may look finer because the dots are smaller, but they have the same number of dots. Let me break this down into something that we can, we can understand. So here's the screen I showed you two slides ago. If I were to broadcast my screen from my computer to my Zoom class, I would be transmitting an image that is 2560 wide by 1440 high. That is a lot of pixels that it's trying to send over the internet to my students. But if I go through and I reduce the size, and let's say that I broadcast from a, a monitor that has what we call full HD, that's 1920 by 1080. 
you can see I still have the same image. It's just a smaller resolution. Therefore, it doesn't send that much information as, as much as the image before. But if I further reduce the resolution of my screen down to 1280 by 720, this is what we call HD. So there's full HD, uh, there's HD, full HD, and then high quality HD. But you can see that these three images that I have stacked on each other, they contain the same information. But this small one is actually half of the size of the big one. And because I'm only pushing that much information to the students, their internet connection might be slow. They might have a small screen. They, you know, they're going to be able to see uh, in a fine detail what it is that, that I'm trying to broadcast. So to put this into standard terms, when I broadcast to my students, I set my resolution of my computer to 1920 by 1080, or what we call full HD. When you guys get your little Blu-ray players or your video game systems, those all broadcast in full HD. So if a student has a screen that can handle the full image, which 90% of the students do, this is what they're gonna see when I broadcast a demo. They'll be able to read the type clearly. They'll be able to see my examples. Everything's great. But I didn't take something into consideration. Sometimes students aren't watching my lectures and demonstrations on their laptop. They might have their laptop open taking notes or working along the problem with me. And what they do is they've got their, their cell phone turned sideways, stuck in the corner, and this is what they see. This is the image that I'm broadcasting. This is the image they're receiving. And if they don't know how to rotate their phone, <laughs> this is what they're seeing. So again, you know, the kind of information that we send out to our students, we need to think about what they have on the other side of the camera. You may be developing slides for your presentations that have very, like maybe two or 300 words on them. Well, if they're watching it on their phone, they won't be able to read that small type. If you have complicated diagrams, they won't be able to see them on that small screen. Now, most of us, we have our slides available for the students so they can download and review them later. But you have to keep in mind that while my intention might be to send them this, they may be receiving it like this. Who, who's never thought of that before? Who's, that's new information. Anybody? Yeah. So, you know, we always talk about the least common denominator. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what we have to think of when it comes to technology. Because really, there are so many different types of laptops and devices and tablets and phones and screens that are out there that we really should do the best we can to deliver the content to our students. So my recommendation, if you know how to go into your computer, so if you have a, if you have like a 21 inch monitor or a, or a 20 inch monitor, your screen is probably set to a full HD, which is 1920 by 1080. That is perfect. But if you have a larger monitor, like I've got a 27, I've seen some 31, some bigger screens, those have more pixels. But you can actually go down into your system and reduce the resolution of your monitor so you can capture a smaller video source to send to your students. Okay. If you need some help with that, go ahead and reach out to me or uh, to Terry or to uh, anyone out there and we can help you to, to reduce the, the size of your screen so you can capture um, better, better stuff. All right, any questions about resolution? Michael? Yes. Um, I just checked chat and you're not listed so I can't send you a chat. So excuse me, I'll speak. How does one change resolution? So what you can, so sister, what kind of um, laptop or computer do you have? Do you have a, a PC or a Macintosh? Uh, I have a PC and right now I'm working on a UIW Dell. Okay. So if you go into your, if you go into like your properties um, okay. inside of it, there's going to be something about the screen or monitor. 
and you can go in there and you can see what resolution your screen is set to. If you're using a standard Dell laptop from the university, your resolution is more than likely already 1920 by 1080. So you're safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if you're on a Mac, you just go into your system preferences, go into your monitors, and you can choose a scale of what you're looking for. And you can just keep dropping them down um, until you find a scale that you're comfortable with. All right. So that's the, uh, the, the screen. So again, screen is really what's important um, and sending the right kind of content along. Uh, I had a student who had a huge 4K monitor that is like 3,600 pixels wide by 2,600 pixels high. And when I had him share his screen in the class, all of a sudden, no one could read anything on the screen because it was sharing something so large and trying to squeeze it into something so small. Um, so again, that might be why if students are sharing their screen during class, you may notice this video size jump in what you download from, from Zoom um, and stuff like that. And that's because you might have students that have those, those, large, those large screens. It might be nice to have something that big, but you know, I don't. All right, so let's talk about the camera, right? I know we all just kind of um, got thrown into this. Uh, someone says, don't call it distance learning, call it crisis learning, <laughs> right? Um, but so I'm gonna talk about the different kind of cameras that are, that are out there. Um, most of us probably just used a built-in webcam. You know, we have our laptop and it's got this little dot right in the top of our screen. And that's what we use to record our, our demonstrations. And what the interesting thing is, is I can look uh, at the folks that are in our, in our Canvas Hour right now, and I can tell whether you have a built-in camera or a secondary camera, or you've got it propped up in a way that the camera is framing you correctly. So thank you for, for that, you know, because we've, we've seen a lot of up people's noses and ceiling fans over heads and stuff like that, that, uh, yeah, we want to present ourselves the, the best we can. And Elda, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> All right. So yeah, sometimes we have built-in webcams on our, on our computers. If we have like a, an iMac or even now um, some of the Dell monitors that Chris is getting for some faculty have built-in webcams right into the secondary display, uh, which is really nice to frame us correctly um, in that. But hey, that's a good camera to use. Some of us might have an external camera, right? Which is what I'm using right now. I actually have several of them. So here's, a, here's the one that, that you guys probably, if you've been on campus, they got us a bunch of these Logitech cameras um, that are really good that we can use to put um, on, our, on our monitors. And so that's what I have uh, right here. It's really good. Um, and uh, you'll notice in the picture right here, there's a little ring light that's next to it. I actually have a ring light <laughs> that's here on my monitor as well. Um, so that I can be bright and I've, I've turned it down so that my sheen doesn't blind you, you know, as we, as we go through this. And this is where I say, Earl, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he's covering his head right now. Let the record show. All right. So webcams, external webcams are, are just great. But then you know how sometimes when you're watching some of those professional videos and their pictures seem so clean and so clear that you're thinking they have some giant studio grade camera? Well, yeah, they have, you know, a, an SLR, a digital SLR that they can connect up to their computer as a, doc, as a, a camera source. So they have a wonderful control of depth of field and they can sharpen and, you know, they can make everything look perfect, right? Yeah, it makes us all kind of sad that we can't have that same kind of quality, you know, of, of what it is. But yes, yes. There, are there are some folks, some folks. that uh, that have um, the means to have a camera like that. There was a, an, an instance when I gave this presentation back in, in uh, April that uh, one of the adjuncts who taught video production, he said, oh, yeah, you should see my setup. And we took a few minutes. And he backed it up and he had lights and he had cameras. He had a boom mic hanging over and all this stuff and a little deck he could switch controls between. And I don't expect anyone to have that. 
<laughs> you know, but hey, his picture looked pretty good. But this is a possibility. So if you do have a digital SLR camera, um, you can hook it up to your laptop or your computer and actually turn it into a camera source that you can use when recording your videos. Now, over here, we have this wonderful thing called a document camera. Now, a lot of us that use it when we do hands-on demonstrations and things like that, we've got a simple document camera we can hook up to our computer so that um, students can see what it is that, for me, when I do marker skills or writing skills or lettering skills, I'm going through and using an overhead camera. But this is really cool. You can get them for between 80 and $300 different resolutions, different features. They even have wireless ones now um, that you can use, but it's a pretty good resource if you've got it. Um, how many of you guys have used the document camera before in your teaching? Okay, good, good. And this is where if I wanted to, I'd go back behind that black curtain back there and pull out my ladybug, my big old red ball with the thing. I think I got that back in like 2007. <laughs> still works. I still use it from time to time, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a relic these days. But if you can't afford one of these document cameras, you can get an overhead tablet mount. Um, this right here is called the Belkin Stage. Uh, I have one of these in my drawing lab on campus that I can just take my iPad or my phone, click it into the top and hook it up to my computer or to my projector and I can send the source signal there and the students can follow along. Um, I can record it uh, without an issue. Um, I even have this guy right here, which is just another tablet mount where I can suction cup this to the table. I can pull this out and then I can take my phone or my iPad and I can click it in here and have a makeshift overhead um, camera without, uh, without any, any issue. So again, you don't have to have some fancy equipment. And uh, I have to do a shout out to, to Mr. Harmson down there because uh, he knows what I'm gonna talk about. Because sometimes you don't have the wherewithal to buy any of this fancy stuff. And so if you wanna have a really cool experience, go ahead and Google homemade document camera. And you will see what many instructors and teachers around the world have tried to put together to create the overhead camera experience. Everything from cooking wire racks stacked in between books to cardboard and PVC monstrosities, um, lots of different kinds of counterweights and balances and different things like that. I remember Earl gave a presentation several months ago where he pulled out what he had done wasn't it just like a stack of books, a plank in your iPhone? It was two cardboard boxes uh, at the right level with a plank of wood where I set my iPad to record. Yep. The real revelation for me was lighting. I had to get the lighting right. So, so it's funny. You can find DIY instructions that if you have a giant cardboard box and those sticky back tea lights, you can just cut a hole in the top of your cardboard box, put your camera up there, mount the tea lights up in the top, and then just draw within the inside surface. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can come up with, with these. So, hey, I've done it in a pinch. <laughs> so has anyone tried to cobble together some sort of document camera to record content for their class? Yeah. So ingenuity, right? Or was it necessity is the mother of invention? <laughs> yep. And so, you know, it's really kind of, kind of cool. One of my favorite ones um, is this one right here, where uh, if you tape a pencil to the back of your, of your laptop uh, screen and take a CD and angle it right, you can get a reflection of what's um, on your keyboard. You can put a piece of paper, piece of paper, over, paper over it and, and turn it into turn it a into document, document camera. Again, you know, like I said, we're, we're creative. We can come up with, with all sorts of things, right? Okay, so we've talked about the screen and we've talked about resolution. We've talked about cameras and different ways to capture either you speaking or um, some of the content you might be creating. I remember sitting and working with uh, folks in the fashion program 
um, they had a camera mounted over the shoulder for the sewing machine. So you could see how they were setting the bobbins and that they were playing with the sergers and getting all those, those intricate things done. Um, I've watched faculty within some of the technology uh, going through and talking about computer parts and putting components together and doing the tried and true thing of having a student just hold the camera and keep moving it in and out as the faculty member was was putting things to together. So there's lots of ways we can go through and capture and create content. It does not need to be high quality publishable material. As long as the students get the idea and it's and it's it's good enough, then that's okay. Don't get caught in the trap that you have to have 20 lights and a certain kind of, you know, whatever, as long as you can get that information across, your students will be grateful for whatever it is that, that they're, that they're, they're getting um, and, and stuff like that. So cool. So let's move on. And uh, or anyone have any questions about cameras? Uh, just as a throw out for, for some of you, um, there is something that is called the cam link. This is a cam link 4k. It is a USB an HDMI to, to USB adapter that you can use to capture any source. So if I wanted to capture something from a video game system or from a, a, a camcorder or from a camera that has an HDMI connection, I can use this and plug this directly into my computer and capture that signal. It's a little under $100, um, but again, it's the CamLink 4K. And yes, that means it can go up to 4K television or 4K video sources if you need it to. Um, but yeah, for less than 100 bucks, you can capture anything that you might need um, for, your, for your classes. Okay? All right. Michael, uh, before yes. you move on, um, uh, I had a question about the monitor resolution real quick. Okay. Um, my 24 inch monitor, I, I, I didn't not have it. I did not have it at the full HD, but now I do. Um, but I tend to increase the size of the text so that I can see better. Some things better. Yes. So I'm set at 150% rather than a hundred percent. So how does that on the other end uh, for the students watching, does that affect anything when I do that? No, it doesn't. What that does is it just, and pardon the, the analogy, but it goes from standard text to Reader's Digest edition, you know, the large print, <laughs> you know, it just kind of <laughs> makes it. Right. That's what I'm doing to do when I avoid using uh, any readers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you just bump it up to Reader's Digest large print, which I try to use that in the classroom, but no one gets that anymore. So, you know, but yeah, if you can bump the text up and that's why um, a lot of the slides that I prepare, if you have like a hundred words on a slide, you either need to reduce the number of words or increase the number of slides. Just, you know, put an idea per slide um, yeah. for, for that. That's okay. It. So, so in, in that case, then um, what I see is what students are seeing then. Yes. Exactly. You know, you sometimes it doesn't translate, but when it's increasing the font size, then it, that's what they are seeing also. Yeah, because all it is, all they're, all you're broadcasting or capturing is just the dimensions of your screen. Okay, so, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. All right. Michael? Yes. Uh, uh, it's Michael Van Doren. Uh, do you have any, uh, yeah, I know you pointed out the Logitech camera. Do you have any other cameras to recommend that are reasonably priced? So Microsoft actually just came out with a new one last week. Um, they actually have a, a microphone and a speaker combination. They have a webcam, com a webcam microphone combination. Um, so if you go to Microsoft's website and Google webcams, it's a, it's a new little square one. And, it's, and it actually has a discount for faculty. Uh, I think they take like 15% off. Um, and it's it's got a really good um, a really good lens on it. Plus, it has the uh, the um, slider to block out the camera, so that you can just turn it off that way rather than trying to find the mute video or, or something like that. So it has that privacy slider um, for that. That's a good one. Um, 
some of the other like I I have I actually have four of these Logitech cameras because um, I have a drawing setup that has an overhead looking down on my on my table, uh, one that's going over my shoulder to show how I hold my hand when I'm holding markers and stuff like that, and then one pointing at my face so that they can see lots of different things. And I have that set up for for me. Um, then I have a fourth floater one in case I need to capture another angle of what it is that I'm I'm working on so my hand's not in the way. Um, and stuff like that. It, 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 it's complicated, but it works for me. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good practical information. Appreciate it. Thanks. No problem. Oh, and um, I wasn't going to let me. So I showed this to Kathy Botero um, and some of you in the education space. There's a company out there called Capture Thought that I got this thing right here. This is a three ring binder thing that you can just put into a standard binder. But what it is, it's used for kids um, and other things in the elementary school space where just to kind of show this. So if they've got this in their binder, they can actually just magnetically click this off. And what it is, is it is a stand that they take the legs out like this. They flip this up like that. And they can take a standard cell phone and turn on the video and set it right here at the top. And then when they set this down in front of them, they can actually have a little space underneath where they can record what it is that they're doing on the back of the little plastic thing is a whiteboard and a marker that they can slide out and there is a notch underneath the stand. So when they take this and let me just kind of, I'll jury rig my, my camera so you can see it. It just kind of slides back underneath here. And because the camera is up here on the top, let me go ahead and let me set this back for a second. Let me turn this video, let me turn this camera capture on. So here is the overhead view of this. And here's my marker. And I can come under here and students can just through Flipgrid or through just a standard thing, they can go through and write and then slide this up further, keep writing, slide it up further and keep writing. And it's just a little mini overhead that the students can use. Um, and it's like $25 or something like that. A little company out of California. Um, What's the I, name of it again, Michael? It's called Capture Thought is the name of the company. You can get it on Amazon. But yeah, and it's just this little guy right here. And you can put it into your uh, into your binder. And they sell them in packs. So if you can get a, and they actually have a, a program where they work with uh, elementary and middle school uh, kids where they'll actually work with you and maybe send you one or two to try out. So yeah, it's Capture Thought is the name of the company. Thank you. You're welcome. I just discovered that just researching one day and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get that, see what it's like. And it works pretty well. But again, nothing that two cardboard boxes, a piece of wood and an iPad can't do. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about the software. Okay, now that we've talked about the resolution, uh, we've talked about cameras and capturing video and content and things like that. Let's talk a little bit about some, some software. Now, I'm going to talk about software in the realm of how to go through and capture our, our lectures, how to capture pre-recorded content and things like that. We all know that the easiest thing to do is to just launch Zoom with no one in the room, hit record, share our screen, and just talk to ourselves. Because then it captures what's on the screen, it records it to the Zoom area and we can download it and distribute it how we want to. That is the easiest way, free, 
doesn't cost you a thing. But again, we're stuck with just the video source with a little box in the corner with our face inside of it. That's the easiest thing to do. Yes, Earl. Michael, I, I not only do the box thing with the iPad, but I really found Zoom effective when wanting to do software demonstrations in Excel or whatever. Because even though I'm the small talking head in the corner, they're really seeing exactly what I'm doing click by click. And I have found those, I call them shorties because I don't make them very long. Yep. Uh, but uh, I found that to be a very effective way of, of doing things that way and, or a Word document or something that you want to go over, like going over the course outline. Mm -hmm. I use Zoom and put that in as part of an orientation to a class. So. Yep. I even did, uh, I taught an asynchronous course uh, last fall um, and I kind of got sick of talking to no audience. And so I actually told, the, I sent an email out to the student saying, hey, I know this is an asynchronous class, but I'm going to be recording some lectures this Friday and Saturday. If you want to jump in and be my live audience and ask questions, go ahead. It's not required. It's not going to affect your grade. It's not going to do any extra credit. But if you just want to come in and be part of the live conversation, and I had six or seven students on a consistent basis log in and want to participate that way. And all I was doing was just capturing exactly as you said, Earl, just typing away and working through it and, and, uh, yeah, really, really nice ways to, to go through and to, to do that. All right, but <laughs> that, uh, that is the, the person in that exercise video that's up in the right-hand corner that's just, you know, sitting in the chair, lifting weights and, and whatnot. You know, that's the, the really easy way. So I wanna talk about some other ways you can go through and capture things that might have a little bit more um, of a, uh, an effect on, on what it is that, that you're teaching. So there are different kinds of screen capture software that are out there that you can use to not only capture the screen, but also to capture your own face and other sources as well. Um, so like I said, with Zoom, it's just stuck to what's on your screen and what's coming through your webcam up in the corner. But if you wanted to have some control over that, like how big to have your picture in the corner or what shape you want it to be in, if you want it to disappear for a time and then come back, um, or maybe you want to do some annotation where you're highlighting portions of the screen or you're adding in a uh, so there are some softwares that will actually capture your key commands. So if you're trying to teach some software, um, there are some, some things that'll do that. There'll be some software where it will track your clicker. And when you click, it'll make a sound and put a circle around it. Um, or you can magnify and zoom in on parts of the screen. So if you want to build content that's a little more immersive, here are three different kinds of software that you can get to go through um, and, to, and to do that. So number one, uh, I'm gonna talk about ScreenFlow. Uh, ScreenFlow is made by um, the Telestream um, who goes through and, and does that. And it's about 130 bucks and that's an academic price. Um, uh, it is Mac only, but they are bringing out a Windows version pretty soon. And it is a screen recorder and a video editor. Um, I can add titles to it. I can add captions. Um, I can call out different sections. I can darken the screen around an area to make them focus on a certain dialogue box or a, a portion of the image. Um, and it allows me to capture the screen and my webcam so I can play with those things independently. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. So that's ScreenFlow. I've been using ScreenFlow for over a decade and I love it. And it's got some really cool things. The new version of 10 just came out and it actually has a lot more robust features in it, but I won't, I won't go that far into it. The second thing we have is Camtasia. Uh, Camtasia is by TechSmith. If you've used something like Jing or uh, Snagit or something like that, that is the same company. Um, Camtasia has an education license of $170. It is for both Mac and for Windows. And like ScreenFlow, it's a screen recorder and a video editor. You can do text effects, you can do text, you can do captions, you can do a whole lot of stuff with it. And it does allow you to capture your screen and your webcam. Now, I'm happy to say 
that we actually have Camtasia as a license for the university. So if you talk to Kathy Botero, you can gain access to a download of Camtasia and you can use that to go through and record and edit your, your videos. Um, I'm kind of a perfectionist. And so when I do live, I make lots of mistakes, but when I pre-record, I still make lots of mistakes, but I can go back and edit and I can cut out things. I can even go through and like what Earl said, I can turn them into shorties and I can you know, record, uh, you know, an hour's worth of content and divide it up into maybe six different five to eight minute videos so they can digest those little nuggets instead of doing a full blown um a full blown hour with me uh so if you want to use camtasia like i said talk to kathy botero and she can instruct you on on how to uh, get a download of that um and we may if, if there are some um needs for it uh, through the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, and even through uh, Terry and folks like that, we may be offering some courses on how to go through and use Camtasia to uh, create um, different content for, uh, for, for your classes. Okay. Has anyone used Camtasia before? Yeah, Elda, it's pretty easy to use, isn't it? Yeah, Earl? Can it take uh, previous recordings and edit them or does it have to be recorded in Camtasia? Nope, you can take any video source and drop it into the library, put it on your timeline uh, and different things like that. And what they'll actually do too is you can capture sources from two different screens. So, you know, I said, I've got a triple monitor set up here. You know, if I'm, if I'm coding on one screen and I'm showing the prototype on the other, I can actually bring those both in, scale them down and students can see both at the same time or I can even do fades between the two um, and, and stuff like that. So depending upon, you know, how involved you want to get, you can get, you can get pretty good with it. Gail put a comment in the chat about having some problems with uh, PowerPoint and Camtasia. Gail, you want to say anything more about that? So um, one yeah. thing that I'd like to do is have the PowerPoint and I narrate it and have me in the little box in the corner. And Camtasia does not always do that. They will sometimes say, well, we're working real well. And then when you play it back, you've got this black box where your face should be. Really? Now, I don't know, maybe students would rather see the black box, but I'd, <laughs> I'd rather they saw my face. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a lot of experience with Camtasia uh, and um, I don't have a lot of experience with PowerPoint either. I'm sorry, I'm a Mac guy, I'm a keynote, I'm a, you know, I, I know enough PowerPoint to make me dangerous. Um, uh, but well, I, it I think- Streamlab does the same thing. One time it'll work, next time it won't work. Yeah, and that's what's fickle about some of those things. So maybe we can recreate the problem and try to help you out with it. Okay, I'll get a hold of Kathy and ask her if she can give me a hand with it then. Cool, cool. Okay, Good thanks. question though. All right. Um, someone says that uh, they're at 200%. So one of the things about if you're going through and bumping up type and things like, you know, if you're in a web browser and you bump up the type by, you know, holding down command or control and doing the plus or minus to zoom in, you can always do a command or control zero and it will take you back to 100% um, if you're working inside of a document um, of, of things like that. But if you are just increasing the text via the, the, sop, via the operating system, You've got to go back in and take it down the same way. Now, and to go to Lisa's comment, she says, can you increase your screen? So I don't know if you're talking about increasing your screen size or just in. No, that was that was back when you were showing that little device that students can do to write. So you're golden. Oh, yeah, so it was really funny. Um, someone asked if, if uh, those document cameras had zoom and I said some do but uh, some have a built-in manual zoom where you pick the object up and move it closer to the camera <laughs> but anyway I digress um, no worries thank you <laughs> no problem all right so this last one that's on this screen uh, this is Streamlabs OBS open broadcasting system um, this is open source. This is free. This is something you can download for Mac or PC. And all it does is it captures different video sources. Uh, if you've got kids or, or no students that watch 
uh, streaming things like Twitch and Discord and stuff like that, where they're watching people play a video game and they're also seeing a tracked uh, thing of who's subscribing or their face in the corner. It's often done through something like Streamlabs, where what you can do is you can, and that, that's what I use to capture my complicated demos, where I can bring four sources in at the same time. I can predefine my screens to say, okay, pull the content from camera one and put it here, camera two and put it here, use this image as a background, and then I can make a second screen that maybe sources cameras two, three, and four, and maybe another screen that just sources camera three. And much like a real video production studio, I can use key commands to fade between the different screens. And on the fly, I can go from a camera pointed to my face to a camera pointing over at the content that I'm drawing on my table. Um, and I can hook up different microphones. I can have multiple microphone sources, uh, different things like that. So it is a whole broadcasting studio that is open source and free, but it has a little bit of a learning curve. Um, and you can either broadcast live or you can record um, the content that it is that, that you're doing. Um, with me and my research into video game interface design, uh, I have a system set up where I can capture content from my consoles as I'm talking into a camera. And it even has a, a camera on my hand showing how the controls or the interactions work. So I can build these complicated systems much like what they can do within fashion when using the sewing machine or going within a chem lab, you know, to show an experiment. You can have a camera on, you know, this burner and this beaker. You can have a camera on this and a camera on the person talking. So you can go through and create a full video production um, just using that, that software. But, you know, um, as Gail says, it is kind of fickle sometimes in the way that it captures and chooses not to capture stuff. Um, but if you want to put together some more complicated demonstrations, Streamlabs is a really good way to go. Have you ever built any sort of complicated uh, demos with that, Gail, or is it just kind of just using it to capture basic content? No, I've, I've done uh, what I consider complicated but um, other people probably wouldn't. I do a lot of the PowerPoint and I've used the whiteboard a lot connected to the computer. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, another thing that I do quite often is I use my phone and I record me doing something on my phone and then put it into a stream, you know, the, the stream yep. that we use for mm -hmm. Canvas. That's about as complicated as I get. Okay. But um, trying to trying to get myself being seen working with that PowerPoint just just didn't work well with either one. So I'm wondering if I can try it with um, with the stream or with Zoom even if I could capture and and do it with Zoom. That might be the easiest way to go rather yes. than trying to play games with PowerPoint. Yeah, Zoom would be Zoom would be good. Because yeah. I could I could show the uh, PowerPoint being uh, recorded through Zoom with a picture of me on there at the same time. Yep, it was funny. Uh, I did a I did some videos where I had my my head where they could see me and they couldn't see me, and I started doing it just so they could see me for every lecture. And in my uh, course evaluation at the end of the term, they said we lo we loved having his face in the corner because it wasn't like we were just listening to this omnipresent voice you know right. they could actually see me and they really appreciated that connection right um, or the black box instead yeah yeah okay interesting it's probably yeah, just I, a source thing but yeah we'll figure that out yeah I'll, I'll try it with zoom and see if it works with zoom that might be the best way to go then cool yeah try it yeah that's okay. we do we experiment yes earl i found one of the pluses with zoom is there's so many backgrounds you can use to set the tone the mood it's not all about the talking head, it's what's behind you. Uh, and, and so to kind of consider the full screen, I think Zoom has so many you know, videos and backgrounds that can uh, help you convey a message. So one thing that's actually, and this is, I wasn't gonna talk about this at all, but I think I'll interject it here. Um, I saw a demonstration, um, I think it was in an ISTE uh, a while ago, um, where a, a teacher said that they hated um, 
you know, sharing their screen so that they were big and all the students were small, that what they actually did is they went through and created a series of backgrounds as slides, loaded them into Zoom, and then the teacher made themselves a little bit smaller, slid off to one side and had all the content right here and just changed her background as she was talking to bring up different words, different pictures, different shapes. So kind of like a newscaster has this little box over here showing pictures. And all they did was load those slides into their background thing inside of Zoom, left that window open. And as talk, just click from slide to slide and change the background each time to show those new things in, in there. And then when they were done, they clicked the background of normal and the teacher just kind of slid back up into the center and started talking to the students again, and then slid back over into the thing and started clicking the slides again in the back. You know, it, it took something to, to do that, you know, to prepare for the class, but I thought that was really interesting insight. Um, so, you know, if, if it fits, if the content fits that, that uh, distribution, then, you know, you might want to try it that way. So anyway, yeah, what they did is they just went into PowerPoint and redid all their slides. So it sat in two thirds of the side of the slide so they could have a place where they could just be sitting. And by, you know, removing the background. Yeah, it was interesting to see. All right, so let me just, uh, we've got a, a, about 10 minutes left here. Um, so if I were to use ScreenFlow, uh, ScreenFlow again, this is version nine, um, 10 just came out two weeks ago and I haven't had a chance to update this yet, but I can go through and I can choose the source. So I can say, I want to record my computer screen and I want to record my webcam. And I can even choose the size that I want my webcam to record at. So I'm having it record at just 640 by 480. Again, it's keeping the file size small so I'm not trying to play with so many giant sources. And then I have it capturing from my microphone, my wonderful little microphone that I've got here hanging over my head. Um, and so I can do that. And then when I hit record, it allows me to go through and to see my screen, to interact with it as I need to. And then when I'm done, it shows me this. So it's a basic video editor where here is my video screen, standard, uh, 19, 8, 1920 by 1080. I've got my two sources of video. I've got my desktop and I've got my webcam. So I shrunk my webcam, put it down here into the corner. And then I took my screen up here and kind of reduced it 10% to make this nice black background through it. And then once I'm done editing, I can put titles in between sections. I can use call outs and different things like that to make my videos. And then I just render it and I can render it to my desktop. I can render it to YouTube. I can render it to Vimeo. I can render it to Dropbox. I can render it to uh, OneDrive. I can render it to a lot of different places uh, straight from, from the software. And so again, you know, a very, very simple editor, nothing that is too crazy or too complex. Um, if you have, if you have experience using things like uh, Adobe Premiere, you know, I could take these, uh, these, these uh, footage sources and move that into there. And I could, um, you know, use that to do some more fancy kind of stuff, but I don't, I don't do that. You know, for me, you know, this is for an audience of 20 <laughs> and my students are not, okay, they just want the content. Now, if I was doing this for an audience of 2 million, yeah, I might want to have a, a, a better source. Um, but again, you know, I often say that, you know, if I put a video on YouTube and within a week, I've got a hundred views, I feel sad. But if I put this video into a class of 20 and I have a view of 17, I feel like a rock star because I've gotten through to 85% of my audience, <laughs> you know, um, of, of something like that. All right. So, um, like I said, I only covered three little things of software. The bottom line is do what's comfortable to you. If all you need is just Zoom to record it and send it out there, perfect, go ahead and do that. If you wanna get a little more complicated with what it is, increase the presentation of it, um, then, then do, do something like, like this. Uh, just to kind of put a pop out, normally with, um, with conferences and stuff these days, they like you to pre-record your content to send it in so people can watch it during the conference. Increase the 
uh, production value of things like that, because then it will be more professional within that realm um, and, and stuff. So anyway, that's just a plug right there. All right. So this is probably my favorite part. Best practices, right? Some things we need to take into consideration so that we create content that we are happy with and that our students will also be happy with. So um, some of the things, and, and like I said, this is just a, a slide. I don't have breakouts for individual things of this. It's just that number one, a camera. Make sure with the camera, it's got a good quality. It's, it's got a good image. It's not you know, too overblown. It is, um, you know, we talk about lighting. Like I've got this little ring light right here. If I didn't have my ring light turned on, this is what I would look like. I'm just kind of dead inside the, the monitor a little bit. Um, but if I have just this little ring light right here turned on and I can even go through and increase the brightness or reduce the brightness, and I can even change the color of the temperature of the light, you know, it adds a little bit more of a, of a human element to it so that I'm not sitting in this dark corner of my studio trying to uh, record, record content. Um, so with lighting, that's great. Uh, some places will say, have some fill lights coming from the side. I don't care about that. As long as you have something coming at your face to help lighten it so they can see you and you're not hiding in a corner, that's fantastic. Number three, framing. This is an argument I have with lots of people, right? We should be front and center to our camera, looking into our camera, interacting with the camera, talking to our students, you know, not this, right? How many meetings have we been in where we're seeing up people's noses? Or what I call the three quarter view, where they're like this, yeah, I really like that idea. That's like they're talking to the person in the box next to them and not talking out to you. Or where you've got the ceiling fan. You can always tell someone's, someone's um, frame rate by their ceiling fan, right? If we're getting a good 30 frames per second, we should see a blur. But if we're seeing individual blades, then we know that they have a slow connection and they're not seeing everything that, that they need to see. So try to frame it within an area that you can, that you can, can see. Title slides. How many of you that when you make your video, you just make the video, you cut it, you upload it, and you send a link out to your students? Well, I always say, take a second and put a title slide at the front of your PowerPoint, have that on the screen for a few seconds so that people know what the topic is, what the class is, what the date or class session is, what the unit is, because that is really important. Um, I had a student uh, come talk to me once who was frustrated with a teacher who was doing an online asynchronous class where they put up the videos for the next two weeks. It was the same video published four times in different links and not the right one. So the student wrote to the faculty member and said, hey, look, you've got the same video uploaded four times. That faculty member went, oh, I'm sorry, let me fix that. And uploaded the wrong video because none of the videos had title slides, none of it was this and none of it was that. And they were even from a different class <laughs> and whatever. So please take a moment, do a title slide at the front of your video and even name your videos with your class number, the class session or date and the topic so that you are organized enough that you can post the right video at the right time. Who's ever been burned by posting the wrong video? I'll admit it, I did that once, you know, but hey, it'll only once. After that, I'm like, all right, I'll never, I'll never do that again. Um, avoid background distractions, you know, whether if like I'm in a studio that's closed, my kids are outside, they never come in, that door's locked. I'm not gonna have any distractions. I don't have any TVs on behind me. I don't have anything that could distract them. Um, sometimes I take everything and back up to my little black curtain back there. So I have nothing behind me. Um, you can get, you know, uh, green screens or little uh, pull down screens. I 
I want to do the nurse's station where I've got that rolling bar across my thing here and just pull the curtain shut and be the man behind the curtain for a while and then, you know, open that back and zoom that back around. But try to, when you're recording, uh, keep the distractions to a minimum. You'll notice that in, in, in some of my videos, I actually crop my image so that it's focused just on my head so you don't see all the rest of the stuff around me. Um, so yeah, try to avoid uh, those, those kinds of things. Although I always get people stopping me and saying, hey, is that a, a baby Yoda over your shoulder? And I'm like, yes, it is, but that's okay because baby Yoda is good. Um, the, one other thing is the microphone. Now I'm going to do a little bit of a test here and I want to see if you guys can can tell the difference. So what I'm doing right now is this is the microphone just off of my MacBook. Can you hear me okay? Does it sound all right? Well, the microphone is actually two feet away from me over off to my left. I'm going to change now to the microphone that is in my webcam that's sitting right here in front of me. So if I change it to can you hear the quality difference between that microphone and this microphone? But then if I take now and I switch that to my overhead mic that I have right here, I've been talking to the whole time. How does this sound? Does this sound pretty crisp and clear? Yeah, so yeah. the microphone that you use will really help with your class. They can understand you. Um, it's good quality. It doesn't pop and cackle and stuff like that. I actually, on my camera, I've got a pop screen filter. So my MBs and Ps and whatnot don't kind of puff the air and blast back at it um, and, uh, and things like that. And uh, yes, Laura, next week I will be uh, doing all of the stuff in Canvas. And it's a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Come back for it. Um, oh, and then the next one. So microphone. Uh, how many of you guys have like uh, the AirPods, you know, just the Apple things or the Apple microphone or whatever? Those are fantastic. And and don't and wear them right. Don't do the antenna version or whatever, you know, make sure they sit in your ears correctly. So, um, you know, so that you're not, you know, some disgraced lawyer in New York that wears them sticking out, you know, as as antennas. Um, but even that, a simple thing like that is, is just fine, okay? So make sure you've got good audio. Listen back to it. Watch your video again. Just don't upload it unknown because one time I uploaded a video unknown and it had no audio because I had forgotten to flip that switch. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> make mistakes once. That's, that's my, my, my motto. Um, and then like Earl said before, keep them short, right? Um, and that's one of the things I'll talk about in my Canvas presentation next week is I've got two kinds of videos, short little videos that I'll embed into Canvas. And then if I do bigger long like lecture captures, I'll put those into stream or into YouTube or upload to, to OneDrive so they can download those and watch them on their own. Um, but yeah, keep them short, you know, small attention span theater. Remember that from the old MTV days when they actually played music and stuff like that? Um, so yeah, keep those keep those those videos short. Um, the last one on hosting videos, um, you can host videos inside of Canvas, and I'll talk about that next week um, on what you can do there. I will just tell you right now that they are trackable, and you can look at analytics to see which students have watched them, how long they watched them, what parts of the video they watched, um, and then uh, how they're actually stored in Canvas. Um, and you have a limited space in there. Uh, Microsoft Stream, which the university has gads of space for us to use. Um, I put long form lectures and demonstrations over there that the students can watch on their own. They're secure, they're stored there. And you can, and if you use Microsoft Teams, you can access those directly into your lessons and, and things like that. There's no way yet to embed a stream lecture into Canvas, I wish there was. Um, but you can post a link that will take them to stream and they can watch it over there. Yes, Earl. Uh, if, if by embed, you mean go hit embed, copy the code and the video shows inside Canvas. I've done that. You have? From stream. Interesting. Um, so I actually, this is, this is kind of something I talk about next week. Um, 
but I actually put my videos into closed classes that can only be accessed by the students once they log in. And so there is no way to remove that protection. So if you do have it open to the public, you can bring those in and embed them. But because I put mine into a closed classroom that's private, I mean, as much as I enjoy going out to the university proper and be able to watch all the biology and the religion videos and stuff like that, I put mine behind a closed door so that only people in my class can see them. Yes, Earl. Um, my, mine is a, a stream group. So they're grouped by classes and only students enrolled in my class can access those particular videos. Really? Okay. And, and so it's, it's easy to just go, uh, if, as, as you're in Canvas, if you want to embed a video, you just go uh, insert, embed, go get the stream embed code, copy, paste, boom, it's in stream. Excuse and even if, it's a, if, even if the group is set to private and closed, it will still load the video? Yes, it, it doesn't really load the video, I think. It just loads the picture. And then once they click on the video, it takes them to um, stream to watch it because okay. they're in the email membership of that particular group. Okay, yeah, that's that's correct. But I, I was just wanting it to play directly into Canvas without having to jump out to another window and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, it, 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 uh, Michael, it does play in Canvas but you do have the option of clicking stream to go to the stream. So you get all the script and everything too, but it plays right in canvas. You and I might have to have another meeting so you can walk me through it, but that's, Hmm. Hey, I learned something today. So, Hey, this is, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> hey, we can hang out afterwards and I'll show you real quick. If you want me to. All right. Um, and then last of all, YouTube and Vimeo, those are professional places you can host your video. There's a lot of, you know, comment and tracking and stuff like that in there that you can do. You can make them private. Uh, you can even make them uh, public. There are some copyright issues that are in there as far as if you use uh, other video sources or music sources and things like that. So my rule of thumb, if there's short little explainer videos that go in with your Canvas content, put them into Canvas Studio. If they are long form, you want students to watch, then make them available inside of Microsoft Stream for them. Uh, YouTube, this is just something for the outside world um, and, and other things like that. And so with that, uh, that's, I used to do all of that in a half an hour <laughs> and then do the Canvas video stuff in another half an hour. So I'm grateful to be able to kind of do a long form on this so that you guys can, can get a little bit of an idea of, of what, what you can do with video. And that's what this was, is what can we do with video? We can do quite a quite a bit of it. So, any questions? Yeah, Michael, I have a question. Yes, uh, and this is the neophyte that I am. In in just downloading video, existing video from YouTube, uh, one of the quandaries is without being subscribed, uh, the, the ads that pop up and that sort of thing. Is there a way around that? I was told there was. Well, so there are, you can, there is a way to pull a link down and then have it not include the, the ads and things like that when you embed it. Um, but I don't have enough experience on that to, to do that. When I, whenever I use uh, YouTube, I like to credit the person that's actually created the content. And so I will right. just put a link out to it. So it opens into an external window so that they can go to that and get all that. And I don't have to worry about any legal issues or anything. Right. Like that. I can just link them to the outside. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Well, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out and to, uh, um, to ask questions. Um, like I said, I think that sometime this fall, I may do some things on uh, Camtasia or ScreenFlow um, just to go through and, uh, and to, to, to do any of, of those things. Um, one of the things that I, I didn't mention in my slides is I actually keep a log um, I have a hard drive that I collect all of my video lectures onto separately because they can take up a lot of space and I don't want them to take up space on my laptop since my laptop has a smaller hard drive. 
So having a secondary drive to store all of those files because they can get gigabytes huge and just store them over there. Um, again, with video, uh, as far as university is concerned, if you capture a video by yourself and it is just you talking to the camera, you can use that in every class you teach in perpetuity. But if you record a lecture live with your students, you can only use it for that class. Um, and so that's why um, sometimes I record lectures just that I want to use if they're software based. And I know they're going to be around for a few semesters. I'll record those separately, independent of the students, and use those from time to time to time. But if there's some interaction there, I do know and make a note that I am only using it for that instance, for that section of that class. Because of all of the privacy issues and different things like that. Michael, Not thank you very much. It was really informative and I'm so glad we divided that uh, the presentation up. Uh, it, it filled an hour and then some. And again, I apologize for the late start. I uh, looked at my cam my calendar wrong this morning. Uh, well, and, and, and thanks to everyone for letting me dodge this a day early because I'm heading out to, to go see my parents tomorrow. And I just wrote Kathy last week and said, can I slide this from Tuesday to Monday? Because I want to be in the air. And I don't think Delta's Wi-Fi is that strong that I can sit there with a mask <laughs> on and deliver this, you know, over that. So thanks for so being So where are you going, time. Michael? Uh, just up to Utah to visit my folks. Oh, nice. Nice. I told my, I told my wife, I said, hey, either the whole family goes or I go by myself. Because uh, I had a trip planned last year with a personal ticket and I had a voucher. I said, I'm just going to go by myself. And my wife's taking classes at UIW right now. So she's in week four, you know, of of yeah. the summer the term and she goes i can't i can't leave next week's week five and so she's like i've, I've got to stay and my kids are working so i'm like see ya so i'm <laughs> heading to the to the land of the frozen chosen up in utah just to hang out <laughs> with my folks where it's actually hotter up there yeah. than it is down here but there's no humidity Amazing. so i won't I'll, I'll scorch a little bit but it'll be fun i I've had some brothers that have had kids in the last couple of years that I haven't seen. So I'm just going to go hang out and be an uncle for a week instead of a dad. So sounds like fun. Sounds like fun. But so I will be broadcasting from my parents' house on Thursday if you, you know, for, for a repeat of this session. So and don't come are, back on Thursday. Are, come we back re next week. are we repeating this thing at noon or did I, uh, did this, move forward i uh, no let me see um i'm on at two o'clock on thursday okay so next one is two at thursday yeah and then you. and then next week um noon on monday and two on wednesday i'll be doing the video in canvas okay great thanks a lot and i'll uh okay. i'll end this for everyone bye-bye well actually um I'm going to hang out with Earl for a minute. If you want to spend Oh, make okay. So I won't end it. Thanks. Yeah. It, 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 will, it will only take a second. I, it's not rocket science. So, uh, hey, Michael, when I'm in, when I'm doing a module, I set up a page inside uh -huh. a module. And inside that page, I can insert, uh, as I edit, you insert things, whether it's documents, text, whatever the case may be. I just click insert, embed. And there's also an embed button on the toolbar. Yeah. And then I go to stream. I find the video that I want to insert. And instead of uh, just inserting the link, I insert by embed. So I get the embed code. And I copy and paste the embed code where it asks me to embed it in Canvas. So insert media. So my, what am I in? I'm in, insert, 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 and go down to embed. I think it's one of the latter selections. Gotcha. Okay. And then you got the embed code. And then I get the embed code from stream, put okay. the embed code in there, and that's where it embeds the video. I'm heading over to that. See, Ed, I knew you could teach me something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not many people know me as Ed, but I'll take it. Remember, Earl, we've been here for a long time. Yes, yes, sir, we have. Yes, sir, we have. Gratefully so. Uh, where are all, there's all the apps and there's stream. And so I'm going to go into my, yeah, for my asynchronous class last fall, I uploaded 46 videos with a total of nearly 52 hours of content. 
I've, I've done very much the same. Now it's three classes for three courses. I've made over 170 videos. All right, so I'm just going to go in. I'm going to grab this one. So I'm going to go to share. I'm embed. Going embed. I'm going to copy that copy. code. Come in here and paste and submit. Let me save and publish. It looks like there's a problem setting in your browser's blocked cookies, disabled this opening a new window. Okay, yeah, that worked. And then one, one of the advantages for the students now that it's embedded is they can just watch it in Canvas and move to the next and move to the next. Or they can click the stream button and it'll take them straight to stream where they get the script and they get a, 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 some other things. So at the bottom of the embed, there's the little stream button so they can actually go Ooh. out of Canvas to go to stream. Okay. Well, I'm going to add a couple of slides to my thing for next week. Then oh, and I'm going to okay. I'm going to I'm going to put thanks Ed down in the corner, and no one will know. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> no one will know. No one will know. But <laughs> I, I originally just thought when it was Blackboard, I just put in links, and I, I think it functionally worked well. But it's just slicker and neater, especially yeah. in Canvas, because I think Canvas is prettier than Blackboard, if you will. Yep. For them to just be able to watch it in there, move to the next previous next i like the way they can flow through the module and the pages um and, and and i think it just sets it up and if you have a title page like you're talking about sometimes that title page is the first thing that shows so it's you know video chapter 10 number two on blah 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 and, and that shows right up top sometimes yeah so, so um, for, for me this is what i have this is my title slide yeah it's got this in here it has the class name the section yeah, yeah. the name of the course and this and I love the, you know, the transcript inside of stream and the captions you can have there. But yeah, every single video is the same template of the same front screen. Mm -hmm. Even me, see how I'm cropped so you can't see a lot of the distractions on the side. Yeah. And so, yeah, when I come in here and go back to my videos, you can see sometimes I'll slide things around to where I'll have my face a little bit bigger just sitting up in a corner, you know, because I'm just showing other things going around. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's daunting sometimes. Now, Susan, Susan uh, uh, maybe just a quick question is one of the reasons I think we use stream is for accessibility, uh, disability yeah. accessibility. And, and, and so that's why I kind of like making sure it's a stream that they can get to. So if they want to read the script because uh, audio is bad or something, um, it's, it's pretty easy for them to go in and out of stream and canvas pretty fluid so so one of the things i'll talk about next week um with canvas studio and video is you still have your captions you still have all of those accessibility things but the video is stored inside of canvas instead of stream and because everyone has a limited space in canvas if you use big videos you're going to fill that space up really quick so yeah. that's why i advocate if you have small little you know one to four minute videos and you want to track them and see the students have got that or integrate them into the video quiz, then do that inside of Canvas. Otherwise, put it all out in the stream. Yeah, uh, I, I would really like to get the analytics on what students are watching, how long are they watching it, when did it, but most of my videos are so large that I don't think studio will afford me that opportunity. And, and that's, that's a little more micromanaging than I, I think I'd like to do. But. Yeah, and that's why, that's why when I, when I do like I'll do little videos for explaining projects, you know, and I'll put exactly. that because that's only going to be three to four minutes long. I'll yeah. put it in there, be able to track that. And then I can also see, okay, this assignment's due in 12 hours. Who's actually watched the prep video Correct. Um, and everything that's correct. It's in because then I can email students saying, I know you haven't watched it yet. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, the things we can do. Exactly. I, I, I don't think I don't think the students I don't think the students realized how much Big Big Brother is really watching. No, I um, think not. So. All right, sweet. Okay, hey. you guys have a wonderful rest hey. of your day. You too. Bye bye. Thanks a bunch. Bye.